In this lesson, we will discuss Euclidean domains. So we now begin studying certain classes of rings that have more algebraic structure than a generic ring. The first class we'll study are, are those with a division algorithm called Euclidean domains. But first we need to define a norm, which is a way to measure the size of an element in a ring R. And as a note, in this lesson, all the rings in this lesson are commutative. So let's define a norm. Any function, let's call it capital N, from an integral domain R, to the non-negative integers with n of 0 equal to 0 is called a norm on R. And so this definition seems a bit generic. We see that norms can take uh, various forms, like you could define n of R to be 0 for every element R in the ring R, and that would be a norm. Further, if n of A is positive when A is not 0, then we say n is a positive norm. So we need these norms to define a, a Euclidean domain. The integral domain R, so again, R is a commutative ring with identity, is called a Euclidean domain if there's a norm N on R. such that for any elements A and B in R with B not equal to zero, there exists a division algorithm. So there exists elements Q and R in R with A equal to Q times B plus R with R equal to zero or the norm of R is less than the norm of B. So we see that an integral domain R is called a Euclidean domain if there is a division algorithm for the elements in the domain. The Element Q is called the quotient. So note Q is the quotient. And R is the remainder. Of the division.
So again, we see that Euclidean domains are integral domains that have a division algorithm. So let's look at some examples of Euclidean domains. Again, our quintessential example of Euclidean domain is the ring of integers. The integers are a Euclidean domain. And we want to abbreviate Euclidean domain as capital E, capital D. And the norm on the integers is n of a equals the absolute value of a. So it's just the usual absolute value. Another quick example of Euclidean domain is any field. So fields are trivial examples of Euclidean domains. So if we let n be any norm on a field f, Then, so for example, you could let n just be the zero function, which maps every element of f to, to zero. But you could take any norm on a field f, then for all elements a, b in the field f with b not equal to zero, We have A equals Q times B plus zero. Since this is a field, we, could, we can let Q be A, B inverse. Since B is not zero, B has an inverse, and we could define Q equal to A, B inverse, which is in the field. And so, again, this shows that a field is trivially a Euclidean domain. For a third example, if F is a field, then the polynomial ring F adjoin X, so that's polynomials in the variable X with coefficients in the field F. then this polynomial ring is a Euclidean domain with norm, if you take the norm of a polynomial P of X and if you let it equal the degree of the polynomial, then F adjoin X is a Euclidean domain with respect to this norm. So let's prove this. We're going to prove that given two elements a of x and b of x in this polynomial ring, we can find q of x and r of x that satisfies the division algorithm. So let a of x, b of x be in this polynomial ring. And we're going to assume that b of x is not 0. Then if, if a of x equals zero, then we could write a of x in the desired form by writing it as zero times b of x plus zero. So therefore the division algorithm holds with a of x when a, a of x is zero. 
So therefore, we may assume that a of x is not zero. So we will prove the existence of q of x and r of x such that a of x equals q of x times b of x plus r of x with r of x equal to zero or the degree of r of x is less than the degree of b of x by induction on n, which is going to be the degree of a of x. So our inductive hypothesis is that we've shown that when a is the zero function, that the division algorithm holds. We're going to assume now that the division algorithm holds for any polynomial of degree less than n. And then we're going to show that the division algorithm follows for, for a of x with degree n. So now let b of x have degree m well if the degree of a which is n is less than m then we can write the division algorithm with q of x equal to zero so then then we may take q of x equal to zero and r of x just equal to a of x. So this will satisfy the division algorithm. So now we're going to suppose that n is greater than or equal to m. And we're going to write a of x as a polynomial of degree n. So it's going to be some coefficient a sub n times x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 times x to the n minus 1 plus a1x plus a0. And we're going to, again, we assume b of x is the polynomial of degree m, so we're going to do the same thing for b of x. We're going to write b of x as b sub m times x to the m all the way down to b1x plus b0. Now we're going to use long division of polynomials. So we're going to divide b of x into a of x and look at the remainder we would get. So we're going to let this remainder be a polynomial called a1 of x. So then let a1 of x be the remainder. So it's gonna look like a of x minus a sub n times b sub m inverse times x to the n minus m times b of x. So again, this is the remainder when b of x is divided into a of x
by long division of polynomials. Now we have in this polynomial a1 of x, we have this bm inverse, but this is well defined since the coefficient b sub m is in a field, and so it has an inverse. So this polynomial is well defined. Since the coefficients are taken from a field, from the field F, and we assume that B sub M was not equal to zero when we made the assumption that B of X is a polynomial of degree M. So the leading coefficient is non-zero. Now this polynomial A1 of X, if we look at it, it actually, if you take the A of X and it's, you're gonna subtract off the leading term of A of X by this calculation, so we see that a1 of x has to be a polynomial of degree less than n. So then a1 of x either equals zero or the degree of a1 of x is less than n. Again, since the leading term of a of x has been subtracted. So now we're going to use the inductive hypothesis that the division algorithm holds since the degree of a1 of x is less than n. So by our inductive hypothesis, There exist polynomials, let's call them Q1 of X and R1 of X. In this polynomial ring that satisfy the division algorithm. So such that A1 of X equals Q1 of X times b of x plus r1 of x. And again, with r1 of x either equal to zero or the degree of r1 of x less than the degree of b of x. So then I'm going to make a substitution and using this division algorithm. So then we have from the definition of a1 of x, we have that a of x can actually be written as a sub n times b sub m inverse x to the n minus m b of x plus a1 of x. And then I'm gonna make a substitution here. I'm going to write a1 of x using the division algorithm. This is gonna be q1 of x times b of x plus r1 of x. And then by factoring out the b of x, 
from the first two terms, we get a n b m inverse, actually n minus m plus q1 of x all times b of x plus r1 of x. And so we see that this polynomial inside the brackets is gonna act like the q of x that we need so the polynomials q of x, which is going to be everything inside these brackets in the previous line. So it's going to be a n b m inverse x to the n minus m plus q1 of x. And the remainder, r1 of x, remember, still has degree less than the degree of b of x, so we can let our r of x just equal r1 of x. Then these two polynomials are the desired polynomials that satisfy the division algorithm. So thus, by the principle of mathematical induction, we see that this polynomial ring is a Euclidean domain. So if F is a field, then the polynomial ring F adjoint X is the Euclidean domain. Now for the next example, we're going to recall the quadratic integer rings that we studied in a previous lecture. So the quadratic integer rings, which we'll just write as script O. These are integral domains. with a norm defined as the absolute value of the field norm. By taking the absolute value, we ensure that the values are non-negative. So although these quadratic integer rings are integral domains with a norm, in general, they are not Euclidean domains. But in the next example, we'll show that the, that the Gaussian integers is a Euclidean domain with this norm. So the Gaussian integers is a Euclidean domain with norm. So if we take the norm of a plus b i, we'll get a squared plus b squared. So let's look at the proof of this. So we're going to let alpha and beta be two Gaussian integers. So let's write alpha as a plus b i, and let's write beta as c plus d i. And further, we want beta to be not equal to zero. 
and we're going to show that we have a Euclidean algorithm on the Gaussian integers. So we can actually do the division of alpha and beta in the field of fractions of the Gaussian integers. So then in the field Q of I, which is the field of fractions. of the Gaussian integers. So we can actually divide, we have coefficients in the rationals. So we have alpha divided by beta equals T plus SI, where if we work it out, A plus BI divided by C plus DI, and rationalize the denominator, you'll get the rational numbers t and s. So t, s are rational numbers, and t will equal ac plus bd divided by c squared plus d squared, and s will equal BC minus AD over C squared plus D squared. So now we're going to define two integers, P and Q. So let P be the integer closest to T. And we're going to let Q be the integer closest to S. So then the farthest away T can be from P is one half. So we see that the distance from T to P is going to be less than or equal to one half. And similarly, the distance from S to Q is no more than one half. So now we're going to do some more algebraic manipulation here. So then we have our alpha divided by beta is T plus SI. But I'm going to write this in this form. I'll write this as P minus P plus T plus the quantity Q minus Q plus S all times I. And we're doing this in order to write this whole quantity as P plus QI. So this is, now recall P and Q are integers. So we have P plus QI, which is an element of the Gaussian integers, plus the quantity T minus P, plus the quantity S minus Q times I. And then if I multiply both sides of this equation by beta, we have alpha equals P plus QI times beta plus this quantity times beta as well. And we claim that the division algorithm is satisfied
with our quotient Q equal to the Gaussian integer P plus QI and the remainder R equal to this quantity T minus P plus S minus Q I all times beta. So we need Q and R to both be Gaussian integers. And so clearly Q, which is P plus Q I, remember P and Q are integers. So P plus Q I is clearly a Gaussian integer. But R is also a Gaussian integer because it is the difference of two Gaussian integers. So since R can be written as alpha minus Q beta, R is a Gaussian integer as well. So it remains to show that the norm of R is less than or equal to the norm of beta. So also, let's look at the norm of R now. So this is the norm of the quantity T minus P plus S minus Q times I and times beta, but the norm is multiplicative. So I can actually break this up as the norm of this factor times the norm of beta. And now we're going to use the fact that P and Q are integers, are the closest integers to T and S. So the norm of this, this first quantity will be equal to T minus P the quantity squared plus S minus Q, the quantity squared, all times the norm of beta, but this is the T minus P, the quantity squared is less than or equal to one fourth. So this whole expression is gonna be less than or equal to one fourth. And similarly, S minus Q, the quantity squared is less than or equal to one fourth. So this is equal to one half the norm of beta, which is gonna be less than the norm of beta. So that establishes the requirements of the division algorithm. And we see that the Gaussian integers is a Euclidean domain. Now we're going to look at an implication of a division algorithm. It actually forces every ideal of R to be principal. So we have the following theorem that every ideal in a Euclidean domain is principal. So that is, it's generated by one element. And as we'll see, that every ideal in the Euclidean domain is generated by the element with minimal norm in that ideal. Let's begin the proof. So we start with thinking about the zero ideal. The zero ideal is always printable, it's always generated by the element zero. So the zero ideal is printable. So now let's let I be a non-zero ideal. Let capital I be a non-zero ideal. of a Euclidean domain K 
capital R. And since I is non-zero, there's a non-zero element in I. So let's let D be any non-zero element of I of minimal norm. So we look at all the elements of I and take any element of I that has the smallest norm possible. So since the norms are all integers, by the well-ordering principle of the integers, we know that this D exists. So such D exists because if we look at the set of all the norms of elements of I, So the set of norm of A, such that A is an I. So this is a non-empty subset of the non-negative integers. And so this has a least element. By the well ordering of the integers. then we claim that the ideal i is generated by d. So since d is contained in i, we see that the ideal generated by D is contained in the ideal I. So we need to show the reverse containment. So let's let A be an element of I. And we need to show that A is a multiple of D. And we're going to use the division algorithm. We're going to divide D into A. So we're going to write A as some quotient D, Q times D plus a remainder. And this is where we're going to use the fact that D has minimal norm. So R must be either zero or the norm of R has to be less than the norm of D. Now we're going to show that R must be in the ideal I and therefore R must be equal to zero because D is the element of I with the smallest norm. Now since A is an element of I and D is an element of I and therefore the multiple QD is an element of I, then R which is the difference A minus QD must be in I as well. But now we have the R equals zero or the norm of R is less than the norm of D. But recall that D has the minimal norm in I. So the only possibility is that R is zero. And we can write A as QD. And 
and therefore A is in the ideal generated by D. So thus I is a subset of the ideal generated by D. We already showed the reverse containment, and therefore we conclude that I equals the ideal generated by D. And so that concludes the theorem. So we've shown that every ideal of Euclidean domain is principal. So a couple of quick consequences of this theorem. So this previous theorem, which states that every ideal of a Euclidean domain is principal, this is another way to prove, this proves again, that every ideal of the integers is principal. So this leads to another class of rings called principal ideal domains. So we see that the integers is actually a principal ideal domain where every ideal is principal. Now, another way that this previous theorem can be used is to actually show that an integral domain is not a Euclidean domain. So we can use the previous theorem to prove some integral domains are not Euclidean domains. And we can do this by proving the existence of ideals that are not principal. So in a previous example, we actually showed that the ideal generated by two and x is not principal in the polynomial ring with integer coefficients. And hence by the previous theorem, we know that the ring Z adjoin X is not a Euclidean domain.